Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, sisters. Um, I'm so glad you can join us today. Um, my name is Michelle Coddington Rogers, and I will be chairing the session, which is called Meet the Movement Movers, Young Women, Power, Climate Justice. And I think even with a title as long as that, it still doesn't incorporate the amazing, empowered um, stories and exp experiences that our sisters are going to be sharing with us today. So my my name is Michelle Codrington Rogers. I am the Honorary Treasurer of NASUWT, the Teachers Union in the UK. But in addition to that, as well as also being a citizenship teacher, I teach 11 to 18 year olds. Um, I'm also a really proud um, uh, kind of uh, expat, I guess is the phrase, but connection, second generation connection to St. Vincent in the Caribbean. And so when we're talking about climate change, we are talking from all the experiences that we have through the connections that we have across the world. And so today is going to be a very rich conversation. And I really do encourage you to please use the chat app um, to please do share in your thoughts and your experiences with the, uh, with the sisters in the room using the chat, but also please do bring forward your questions and answers in the questions and answers box. So as we uh, move into the second day of the fourth EI World Women's Conference, it's important to reflect on what, the, uh, what we have been discussing up until now and thinking about the challenges that women and girls in education experience especially in the fight for gender equality, but also thinking and reflecting on the strategies that education unions and our members can use to help overcome those because we go into teaching to make the world a better place. But one challenge that cannot be ignored, no matter where you are coming from, is the enfolding climate crisis or climate emergency. And for those of you who were following the UN CSW uh, this, this just gone this year, you will know that climate, the climate emergency was the key discussion of, of and key theme of the work that the UN uh, Commission for the Status of Women is reflecting on. Climate change does disproportionately impact on women and girls, especially the most marginalized women, such as people from indigenous communities or people with disabilities and women and girls um, understand and feel the gendered impact of climate change. It's not anecdotal, it's real life. In times of climate induced crisis and emergencies such as natural disasters, droughts, resource scarcity, girls are more likely than boys to be taken out of school. And the rates of domestic violence and abuse, early marriage and pregnancy increases. And as teachers, we see that. When we walk into that classroom and expect to see that child and they're not there, we feel that, we feel that loss. And this is why, for example, the UN's Sustainable Development Goals are so important. They're crucial as levers to make sure that our governments are doing the right thing to make sure that women and girls are able to be the best that they could be. In this complex landscape of intersecting vulnerabilities, education is a vital part of any effective solution. Students, especially girls in all of their diversity, have a right to an education an education that will equip them with the skills and knowledge and tools needed to live safely in an environmentally sustainable world. For them each to be able to lead fulfilling lives and to participate in a green economy. However, women and girls are often not given a seat at the international, national, or sometimes even local table. Despite being key leaders in the movement for climate justice, disproportionately impacted by climate disasters, and oftentimes the first responders to climate disasters, our voices are often missing from those tables of where we're able to influence and direct change. However, thanks to EI, today we are joined by some phenomenal young women who are not just making a seat for themselves, in some cases, they are creating the whole table and they are making sure that they are creating spaces to be able to bring their activism forward, but they're also reaching back and bringing the next generation of activists with them. 
So today I have the absolute pleasure to be joined in conversation with some powerful climate activists. We're joined by Vanessa, Mitzi, Janelle, Laura and Phoebe. And we will be using our time together today to have a, a discussion which may be uncomfortable and challenging in places, but we are able to understand and explore the impact of the climate emergency through the eyes of these phenomenal and inspirational young women. So on that note, I couldn't possibly give your, your bios and your introductions any more justice than you just being able to introduce yourselves to this space today. We've got nearly, uh, we've got more than a hundred educators across the world in this room. Please use this space and make sure that you are taking your flowers because you each deserve it. So on that note, I'm going to ask Vanessa to introduce herself briefly. Then I'll ask Laura, Phoebe, and then Mitzi. Vanessa, if you'd like to unmute. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Vanessa Nakate. I am a climate justice activist from Uganda and I work with the Rise Up Movement, also the author of A Bigger Picture. Very happy to be here. Thank you, Vanessa. Laura, if you'd like to unmute. Hi everyone, um, I'm Laura. Thanks for taking the time to, to pronounce it. Um, I'm from Colombia. I say that I'm from the Colombian Andean mountains because Colombia is huge. Uh, so I kind of like, uh, pos like yeah, make my positionality from the Andean region of Colombia. I'm an ecofeminist, I'm a climate activist. Um, and also because I know that we're with translations, I say that I, I come from a peasant family, but peasant is in Spanish campesino and not farmer, which is granjero. So just to take it into account in, in the Spanish translation. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And thank you very much for making that distinction as well. As teachers, we always learn from our students. So please don't apologize for, for giving us that information. I'm going to ask Phoebe, please, and meet. Hi everybody, I'm Phoebe, I'm from the UK um, and I'm a climate activist that focuses particularly on education, so climate education, bringing climate into all of our education system and empowering young people and bringing young people into spaces of political power, walking the corridors of power as everybody in this call has done at some point, I've watched them do and they've been amazing at it. Um, really happy to join you today. Brilliant, thank you Phoebe and Mitzi, if I can ask you to unmute and introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Mitzi Janelle Tan and I'm a climate justice activist from the Philippines. I am with Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines or YACUP, which is a really long name, but we're basically the Fridays for Future of our country and I also do a lot of things internationally with these amazing people as well. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Fantastic. And to kind of do a bit, a bit of a warm up um, and so that we can start to feel this space that we're in. I'm going to ask you each a question and I'm, you know, as, as sisters in a room, we are very respectful and I'm just going to ask just the mute because I want this to be a conversation. Um, so what does climate justice look like to you? I'm going to leave that question there and I'm going to see who wants to unmute first. I think for me, it looks like community. It looks like hope. It looks like how I feel when I come back to my hometown after being at university all year, which is the exact situation that I'm in right now. It feels safe and lovely. And it feels like practicing that sense of hope every day in spite of everything, in spite of all the horrible intensity that we're living through right now, leaning into the belief that another world is possible and that we can achieve it. Fantastic. Thanks, Phoebe, for sharing that. Some really powerful words there. I'm going to see if, who's going to be next. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to possibly go with Mitzi because she's smiling and she looks like she's ready to go. Mitzi, if you'd like to unmute. I think Vanessa just unmuted herself. So if you want to go first, Vanessa. No. <laughs> um, I smile because I always have two very different answers when I answer this. So in spaces where climate justice and climate action isn't talked about as much, I go very detailed and it's like reparations from the global north to the global south and it's, you know, drastic emission cuts and it's um, 
recognizing that loss and damages is something that has to be talked about, but in spaces where it is something that we're already familiar with, I like to get a little bit more creative and talk about how climate justice feels like that experience when I met all these three beautiful, amazing women in person for the first time, and it felt like we were meeting family. It's that moment where we are dancing on the streets to songs that we don't know the lyrics of because it's in a different language, and we're really truly exhibiting that international collaboration where this is what we're trying to fight for that world where language isn't a barrier where even if we're coming from such different contexts we're meeting in one place fighting for the same thing i think that is the world that we're trying to build together and that is what climate justice looks like to me just having that chance to be able to sing and dance with all my friends from across the world because we're all fighting for the same thing Fantastic, Mitzi. You that kind of you just painted a really visual and tangible picture to, for us of that kind of coming together and being in that space and knowing that everybody is there for the same reason. So thank you for sharing that. I'm going to ask Vanessa. Thank you. Well, for me, just to really add on what Phoebe and Mitzi have said, climate justice is just about the people and the planet. Many times when people talk about uh, the climate issues and the crisis, it's mostly a conversation of, you know, what we can do um, about the planet, about emissions. And there's really lack of, you know, the heart of the people is not in the conversation. So you end up hearing so much conversation about the necessary technology that is needed. For example, you hear conversations on electric vehicles, but then there is a lack of, you know, the people in the conversation. When you talk about electric vehicles, it's obviously for a specific group of people and not everyone. So for me, climate justice is not leaving anyone behind as we address the climate crisis. I muted myself, I do apologize. Thank you, Vanessa, that was that was really powerful as well. I know we're going to have a good conversation today. You guys are getting us off to the, into the right space already, but that idea of who's not at the table, who's not able to have their voices heard, who's not able to point out that that action isn't necessarily the best action to bring everybody along. Um, and so, no, thank you so much for sharing that. And Laura? Um... Same as Mitzi in terms of like I like I divide I don't know like how it looks like a eh, climate justice depending on the context like in the local scale might be looking away and in international space the climate justice may might look in another way but now that we're like it's kind of the international platform conversation I will say that climate justice looked like a eh, was saying like a community also like a diverse community because we come from a different parts of the world of communities of cultures and also climate justice for me is a lot about questioning like the the the, the western system but also yourself like to question and also recognize your privilege yes because everything that we are like sadly is very uh, intertwined with actually what produce the climate crisis and for me climate justice is also about recognizing those privileges and things that have in a way uh, produce also the, the climate crisis. Thank you Laura and you know that idea about diversity and the importance of it being there but also I love that idea that we actually can take what is seems like a huge big problem which is this the, you know the climate emergency and actually apply it to the context that we're in whether it's local, whether it's national, but actually all recognizing that it's all part of this jigsaw puzzle piece that is international, that idea of it's a collective action um, and that we can recognize our privilege to use, uh, to kind of use our, our platforms, our, where we are to kind of add to that, that jigsaw puzzle. So hopefully we're now all warmed up. We're all comfortable. We're all able to think right. So by the end of this conversation, we're going to have an absolute plan of how we're going to get climate justice. Everyone's going to say, this is all we need to do. And it's all going to be 
kind of so actionable and tangible that we're going to come away from this space saying we've had our orders Vanessa, Laura, Phoebe and Mitzi have told us what we need to do and now we've just got to get on with doing it that's my goal that's my aim so <laughs> what I'm going to ask next is they're kind of thinking about where talking about where we are we've seen students across the world mobilizing for climate justice and actually it puts I'm going to be honest it puts the politicians to shame that our children and our young people are basically saying, we're telling you this is important and you're not listening. And then we hear like 10, 15 years later, we'll hear a politician go, we need to be talking about climate justice, climate change. And it's like, dude, you're late to the party. We've been talking about this and doing this already. So I'm going to ask, what do you think the importance or the role of climate education is in relation to climate justice? And what do we need within the education system? Remembering that we're talking to a room of educators, what do we need to be doing to be making sure that we're giving our children and young people that support, but also that aspiration to make that change? And I'm going to, I'm going to go with whoever goes first. Well, I think for me, climate education is really important because one, it helps really create awareness of what is happening, uh, especially in schools and with the students and with the teachers. I personally, I remember probably in geography class uh, learning about climate change, but then I, you know, it ended on what climate change is and not like the actual impact. And if you were to ask, you know, most of the students would tell you that climate change are, you know, the changes in weather conditions over a long period of time, but they, uh, the students just carry that definition, but they don't really carry um, the reality of the experience that is happening on the ground. So we hear climate change being talked about in schools, but it's not talked about with the you know, reality and experience that really comes with it. It was until, you know, 2018 for me that I realized how much it was affecting the lives of so many people right now and how much it was beyond, you know, that definition and how much it was beyond, you know, the impacts that I put on paper for an exam and how it was actually happening. So I think climate education is really important. It really uh, communicates and also inspires young people to do something when it comes to the environment and the planet, but also, you know, the quality of that education is very important. It's important that it doesn't end on the definition of what climate change is, but on what's happening, you know, on the ground. And it also shouldn't just end on what's happening on the ground. It should really empower young people to believe that they you know, they can do something, they can help transform their communities, that no one is too small to make a difference and no voice, to, no voice is too small to transform the world. I think it's important for students to, you know, to know that. And also in addition to, you know, climate education, but in specific to girls education, we know how cl the climate crisis disproportionately affects women and girls how you know as the disasters occur many girls drop out of school and many women face extreme you know inequalities they are on the front lines when these disasters happen so just to really add on climate education there is a need to also you know really increase the the girls education in communities and women empowerment to help build resilience and you know to help um, reduce existing inequalities because no girl will be able to get the climate education if they're not in school in the first place. So I think um, it's important that as we discuss climate education, we really discuss the need for girls' education as a climate solution. Absolutely, Vanessa. And I think the fact of the matter is that for our women and girls, they are living the reality. So they're the ones who it may not have they may not have the definition, but they're living the reality and they're having to navigate it. And I'm kind of just going to leave it there with Mitzi because, you know, I'm going to pass. I'm going to kind of tag team Mitzi because we are talking about the lived experiences of women and girls. Right. Yeah. So 
I was just going to say almost the same thing as Vanessa. The way that climate education was taught to us in school was very technical and foreign and alienating. I remember learning about it in elementary school. And they told us as if it was a scientific fact, not something that could be changed or that should be changed. The way they taught climate change to us was as if what we were already experiencing, the typhoons that we were experiencing in the Philippines wasn't related to it at all. I didn't learn that what I was experiencing growing up and what my communities were experiencing growing up was climate change until much later on um, when I was able to talk to other activists as well. And so that is the crucial moment of climate education because it's difficult to empower people to act if they don't even know that there is something that can be done. So right now, everyone in the Philippines understands that there's something wrong with typhoons, but then it's so difficult to connect it to the fossil fuel industries that's behind it, to the profit-oriented system that's behind it, to the global North countries that are causing the climate crisis because it's not something that is readily available to people. And with climate education, even with the language that we use, it's so important because I could translate, let's say, climate change or carbon dioxide emissions into Filipino, but no one will understand me because it is such a scientific um, term to begin with. And that in itself is not accessible. And I think Laura has talked about this in the past and she's shaking her head, so she'll probably say something. <laughs> I, I will go right away. Uh, yeah, actually, we have talked this. Like, I think that actually we all are friends, so we have talked about this uh, in one way or, no, or another. Um, right now, actually, I'm studying education, gender, and development in a British university. Uh, so I've like catch many, many, many flaws on education. Like, uh, I agree with all of what they have said. Uh, also, because I think that we have learned like. It's like taking a class of climate education, but like half of it, like we have attended like half of the sessions because like the most important thing about the impacts and also about like the contextualization of education is not given uh, to us. And also like, I will say that is not only about climate education, but like education in general, uh, because education is pretty westernized. Uh, and like I'm from Colombia, I started in Colombia, I started in Spanish, but I started through this Western like lens. Um, and so I didn't learn about the climate change, about global, global warming within my own context, but also I just learned it through the numbers, through the science, to the European science. And that like marginalized and like erases for complete, like the knowledge that my people have put it into like a taking care of the earth, of the soil. Uh, and we don't know anything about that. And also about history, like it's crazy because I keep learning things about my culture, about my colonization, about my history, but it's just because I'm, like actively looking for it because literally like it's been erased like I find like I don't know like huge figures of like uh, independence and like indigenous peoples but they are completely erased like from the formal um, education uh, and it's just because we need to find it and another thing that is pretty linked to that is like this also separation about formal and informal education. Like one of the things, for example, in Colombia, like this, the, the education is so into like, like they want to get the education system want to uh, give to us like skills and knowledges, uh, but they only work for the Western capitalist, racist, colonial and like modern system. So they, like to us to I don't know to be engineers to be scientists to be administrators but for example in Colombia a lot of the also like the 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 works the the job opportunities the good conditions of life come from the art from the culture from the sports and that is considered not like education like in a formal education and all of that is very very connected with like climate change with climate education because like the climate action is also very, very connected with what is done in the ground and what is done in the ground is not really like the science and engineering uh, stuff. 
I think Laura, the whole room felt that sigh <laughs> and all kind of going, we know, we feel that. And you've re you actually raised some really important points about the education system and what we teach. And I know as a teacher, I, I say in front of my classes, I say, OK, this is what I'm telling you, because this is what you need for the exam. However, this is what you need to know. And I think education has to be about thinking, understanding and action. And we tend to lose that when we're so focused on the exam, the output. What do you need to be to be uh, you know, a productive member of an economic capitalist society, which is basically allowing those who are already rich to get even richer off of the back of us. As the, as the people. So thank you so much for giving us that insight. So now I, I tag team over to Phoebe. <laughs> I've been waiting with my, my education, climate education knowledge. Um, I think I'm talking specifically from a UK context here, but what you're saying there about education needs to go beyond the specific knowledge. It needs to go beyond the textbooks, beyond the exams. It needs to go into something where young people are given a space to be able to talk about their feelings. I spent so much of my life in a school and the daughter of a teacher I grew up in schools beyond just being a student and I think what young people see what I see right now when I go into schools is young people that are scared and not just in the dictionary definition of that they feel we've been raised to place our faith in institutions and in leaders to safeguard our lives and our livelihoods and in our eyes they have failed us we are scared not just in the like global warming side of things we're scared because the entire foundations of the life that our parents have have been able to place their faith in in some cases has completely crumbled around us the terror that i see online in the schools and in youth groups it's not just a fear of global warming itself but a complete loss of faith in institutions that hold our society together that instead of protecting us they're actively putting us in harm's way and when i say that to people that that seems like really dramatic and to be honest, it's a completely rational reaction to the constant inadequacy of climate policy and what education needs to do is it needs to give young people a space to be able to talk about that. It needs to give young people a space where we have become so jaded and we've become so scared and we have become a generation that kind of switches off from the constancy of the world that we're living in. I think I I had my first phone at probably about 11 and it has been constant BBC news notifications ever since then. We're the first generation to be so plugged in to the absolute terror of the world that we're growing up in. And we're probably the first generation to be given ultimate responsibility for that. I can't tell you how many times I've been told I am the leader of the future, that we are going to solve everything. Our generation is going to be like these amazing leaders. And that is great. Wonderful. Thank you. But I don't think anyone knows what it's like to number one with the knowledge side of things to see climate change as this big impossible end of game monster that you don't have the tools you weren't given the knowledge the tools to be able to actually kill you sit scared of that monster you sit you either sit scared of it or you pretend that it doesn't exist completely neither of those options is the green workforce of the future neither are going to be properly equipped to be able to deal with climate change in the uk we talk about the green industrial revolution and we talk about how every job can be a green job but yet the only kids that are being taught about climate change are geographers and scientists and not every single student i didn't choose geography or science in schools and my climate education was a page in a textbook and it was an examined page in a textbook it wasn't anything that actually allowed me to explore my feelings that allowed me to be able to talk about the the absolute terror that i was feeling about the world i was growing up in it was just something that was very scientific like mitzi was talking about it's if we want to build the solution makers of the future, we need to teach them how to do that. And we need to give them the spaces to be able to not be completely burnt out going into their future jobs. I'm glad you mentioned that, Phoebe, because I see it. I see it, I see it with my students. And um, I think it's really crucial that actually it's not just for geographers and scientists. It's for all subjects to really give that space to children and young people, but also give them the ideas of how they can take it forward. What is next? It's not just saying there's this crisis and you guys now have to go and sort it out. Oh, I bet, you know, you're 11 years old. You, you know, you should come up with that solution in the next seven years. Um, and we want, if you don't, then you're going to fail. 
Um, but actually being able to express that fear is so crucial without that kind of negative response of being called a snowflake. You know, it's like, that really, really irritates me. Our children are expressing a real fear and real worry and concerns and a, and a vision for the future. And they get shut up so quickly just by the use of certain words and certain phrases. Vanessa, would like to come in? Yes, uh, thank you. I just really wanted to add something on climate education. So the, some of the teachers that we've interacted with, for example, in Uganda, some of them, they, wish to have um, certain kind of tools or certain kind of trainings to help them better carry out you know climate education and to help them better convey the message to the students beyond what is in the textbooks so i think that in addition to climate education there's really a need to uh, put in place the necessary tools or information or trainings or workshops that can really help guide teachers on how to convey you know, the issue of climate education because some do want to do that, but they, uh, they don't have you know, enough information beyond what is in the textbook. So I think that yeah, it would be good to have a discussion on yeah, training teachers as well in regards to climate education. And I think we also need that space for teachers as well. I mean, teachers need to have that space where they can learn from each other. And one thing that seems is coming through on this conversation so much is how in sync you all are. I mean, I can tell that you probably had hours and hours of conversations and discussions, but also you've had the support. So, you know, you're walking into a space knowing that there are people in there who are holding open that space. And I think that's really crucial for us to create that space as well, for both students, but also for teachers as well. Because I know that when my students have these conversations, I sit and I just, and I'm awed, I'm overawed in, you know, where their thoughts, where their uh, conversation goes when they're just given that space. But one of the things that I know that my students also bring up and, and talk about a lot, especially since, you know, I introduced them to the concept, um, because I'm going to take that credit, is around intersectionality. Because when we're talking about climate change, we're talking about an intersectional approach. And that discussion around the fact that our curriculum is so Western, let's be honest, it's so European. And Europe is centered and until it impacts on Europe then it's not an issue it's something that other countries deal with you know oh it's another typhoon oh it's another volcano eruption oh it's another you know and it's another hurricane but actually for those of us who have got those connections cross community cross identity it's very real and you know that's one of the big things that we need to grapple with is that idea of approach to the climate emergency, and I'm going to call it a climate emergency, that is intersectional, intergenerational, but is also intersectoral, and how we can bring that all together. And I know that in your conversations, you've all been having that, you've been talking about it. And so I'm going to say, how, how, and where does your conversations go when you're talking about this intersectional, inter, intergenerational approach to climate change? Where do, you, do your conversations go? I can go in this one first one. <laughs> um, I don't know, like maybe linking also with what I was saying, it's very important that it must be also the climate action intersectoral because um, I'm in Colombia, I'm part of Fridays for Future Bogota and Colombia, but also like this collective that we created called Pacto por el Clima. And one of the most amazing things about this collective is like is intersectoral, like interdisciplinary. So obviously there are a lot of engineers, scientists, um, like law people, but there are also like a few of us that are like more into the arts, into the music and like the alternative stuff. And like what I have seen is like, we have nourished a lot like the message of a climate action and also in terms of intersectionality um, 
like also in education, I see, especially like in spaces like, I don't know, London and uh, like these uh, European countries that they are like, they, they have so, so much diversity. I don't know, this is the tricky English, but I don't know. Uh, uh, they, yeah, they have so many cultures. Like when you talk about, for example, women's rights, like the first thing that comes into your mind is probably like a white woman. And like, if you just talk about like women rights, you're probably like forgetting like all the, all the, all the, all the other women, all the other girls that do not fit in like the first thought into this stack. So we need to talk about also gender and race. And for me personally, I think that it's actually very, very uh, dangerous to talk just about like one, one thing and separate to the, to the other because in that way you're forgetting like all the people that are like like living behind in these intersections and i'd like to add to that in the sense that i think it's so important that um we have an intersectional approach to the climate crisis or climate justice otherwise as vanessa said earlier people will get left behind um, because that's what's been happening for ages for decades uh, we've kind of seen it with the COVID vaccines where who's out of the pandemic, right? It's the global North countries, but the countries that are least responsible, who are, that are most vulnerable to everything, to everything that the system throws at us are always left behind. It's going to be the same with climate justice. Um, there is this thing happening now in some countries where renewable energy is becoming more popular, but farmers are displaced for solar farms. Indigenous peoples are displaced for hydroelectric dams. So it's again, climate justice for whom? Technology for whom? Making sure that we don't leave anyone behind and that we can only have that if we have an intersectional approach. If you remember that it is the people who are um, economically marginalized and who are um, racialized and uh, disabled, it, it, all these things come together and they amplify the climate crisis and are amplified by the climate crisis. And so we need to make sure that when we're fighting for climate justice, it's for the true majority, right? It's because the minorities, we're not really minorities. Um, if you put us all together, we're actually the global majority. It's the elite, it's the 1%, it's the very few rich old white men that are actually causing the climate crisis. And that is what we have to remember when we're talking about climate justice. I think you've really picked up on a, a really clear point there, which is we are a global majority and we it's so easy to convince us that we're not, because when we get put into these little these little uh, kind of silos that you're focusing on women's rights, you're focusing on LGBTI plus rights, you're focusing on, you know, dis people with disabilities rights, actually, there are so many overarching themes that we can't always see and bring together because it works for the people who want to keep the power, doesn't it? It really does. If we're divided and fighting for the, for the resources that are left over, then we are more busy trying to kind of protect what we've got rather than see actually we're part of something much, much bigger. And I'm going to kind of bring in, because I know that you, some of you, all of you in this room have basically walked into spaces of power and decision and tip the table upside down. And so I want, you know, kind of, can you share with us, you know, that taking that intersectional, intergenerational, intersectoral approach into those spaces and how do you use your time in that space to have the most impact? Well, uh, for me, I think that when it comes to intergenerational conversation, I think they are very much needed to address the climate crisis. And I know that there, there have been, you know, different movements that have worked on, you know, climate issues before what we are doing right now. So I believe that there is something to learn from each other. There is a place of collaboration. There is a place of bridging because in the end, we are all, demanding for climate justice. And when it comes to you know, the rooms that we get in, I think the most important thing is remembering that if we are going to the streets, it's for the people. You know, If we are doing different mobilization in our communities, it is for the people. Because when you bring the people in the conversation, that's what really makes it intersectional. 
if you start to bring in how women are impacted by the climate crisis, how girls are impacted, how communities are being driven into extreme poverty because of climate disasters, how you know peace and security are also being disrupted again because of the root cause of climate change. So I think when we bring people um, in the conversation, that really brings the power in the room because with the people come you know experiences, with the people come stories and with the people come solutions, yeah. Phoebe, I'm going to say, you know, what do you think in relation to how we bring that, I guess Vanessa's saying that's fight from the streets into those places of where decisions are being made? Uh, I was thinking about this last night and genuinely, I think that the only way to, the only thing that you need to be able to challenge institutions of power and get into it is so, so much grit. You need so I can't explain to you how difficult it is to, we're included in rooms a lot of the time nowadays as young climate activists, particularly in climate policy rooms, because it's a good photo opportunity. It's a good way for them to look progressive and for them to look like they're, they're really like woke and just like it's a good social media thing for them to do. I can't tell you how many rooms that I've sat in, particularly here in the UK, we've got a lot of elected representatives at pretty much every level of governance. I've spoken to so many of them and it's been so blatantly clear that they're just smiling and nodding and just kind of like, yeah, 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 sounds really good. And like, even when I give them specific policy asks of exactly what I want them to do, like holding their hand and taking them through exactly what I want them to do, they just kind of smile and nod and do exactly the same thing that they've always done. I think when it comes to intergenerational collaboration, it's so important, but it's also so important to recognize that there is a very prominent like um, level of power in that room. There are, we, we, we don't come into that room at the same level as the people that are in those positions of power do. And that is a horrible position to be in as a young person when you care so, so much and you really, really want them to do something. And you, when you talk about climate education and you talk to educational leaders, you talk to people who have the power to be able to change these systems and you come in with these really idealistic, grandiose ideas and you come in and you really want them to change things and they just kind of like smile and just go about their way. It is horrible and I can't express how horrible it is. And it involves so many different, it involves those protest strategies. It involves the kind of outside, like changing the, the, the media landscape. It means shifting, like Fridays for Future has done so much to be able to change how we think about climate change towards something that is climate justice linked instead of just net zero emissions. It has done so much to change what we think about climate change, how the people in power think about climate change. It kind of sets the standard a little bit of how they should be thinking about this. It also means doing that inside work of constantly being rejected. And that is horrible. And I don't really have a solution for it. Um, <laughs> Mitzi, I know you've done a lot of stuff in this level. Is there anything you would say? I think it's similar to what Vanessa and you already said, where you go into these spaces knowing that you're not alone, knowing that you have the people's strength with you and that that is what you're carrying. Um, in the Philippines, you work, when I think of intergenerational collaboration, I don't really think of the politicians. I think more of the small farmers that we work with. Sorry, I, have to, I feel like I always have to explain this, but in the Philippines, farming is like medieval Europe where we're doing everything with hand. Um, landlessness is rampant. Our farmers don't have their own land because of landlords and because of um, all this. Uh, so anyway, it's with small farmers and small fisher folk and our indigenous peoples and our workers that we collaborate with. They're the ones that we see the intergenerational struggle should be with. And then we coordinate and we go talk to politicians to pressure them and try to gain concrete gains for our campaigns. But it is always a very difficult thing because you always have to weigh will they gain more from taking a photo op with you than you actually getting something out of this conversation? And I think there are times when it is good to be able to speak to certain politicians and to um, pressure them and to talk to them and have these dialogues. But there are some politicians, for example, here in the Philippines, I would never ever talk to um, because I don't want them to change. I want them to be kicked out of power. Um, so it's these nuances that it's so difficult. And so I never actually know like 
I do a lot of the policy work and I, I am in these conferences, but it's not my favorite thing to do. I prefer being on the streets. That's where the real power is, um, having that collective um, action and, and pressuring people on the streets. And I have so much respect for the people who have the patience to really go to the policy making decisions day by day. And I've talked to them and they've said how, you know, pressure on the streets, it complements the action inside and it helps um, push forward things there. Uh, Laura, do you want to go? Yes, um, I definitely get you when you say that it's difficult because now I'm thinking and I feel like the need of speaking in Spanish right now, now that I have the, the opportunity actually, because this is kind of difficult to uh, uh, explain in, in, in English. Uh, El año pasado en la COP, Last year, en la COP 26, as Mitzi was saying, I think that you needed to change the channel. But yeah, but I'm, but I'm going to, to carry on speaking Spanish, Spanish, if you don't mind. Eh, so, as I was saying, we had the chance to speak with the Ministry for the Environment of Colombia. And I, I can criticize the Colombian government in, in so many ways. Colombia is a terrible country to defend the territory, to defend nature, to defend life. And the government and the state are silent about a violation of human rights, but they always talk about how many trees have been planted, how much land is now, uh, are now uh, natural reserves. So I can certainly criticize my government. But from my conversation with the Minister for the Environment, at the COP, um, I realize that they also have a very specific power dynamics. And they said, literally, that they don't really have the chance to speak. And certainly, they didn't have the chance to use our language because the people that lead those conversations are European countries and they're only concerned about uh, money and they only talk about um, carbon emissions. So as Latin American countries, they said that they couldn't talk about human rights. So it's really very difficult because it's a power struggle. There's a, a power dynamic between uh, activists and the Colombian government and also between the uh, Colombian government and other and, uh, European uh, countries and uh, Western uh, countries. But like, this is so tricky. And this is why we have got interpreters, Laura, because if you, sometimes the only way you can truly express yourself is in your language, using your words, um, and whether or not it's that kind of being able to speak with that passion. So, and I think it's so crucial what you said. It's so important that although we're talking to politicians, and the people who've got the power, they've also got their own restraints. And we're talking about global global um, dynamics here, aren't we? We're talking about the kind, as you said, the hierarchy, the kind of the relationship between certain countries. And, you know, I'm very much, we can't talk about climate change and climate action if we don't talk about decolonization. You know, you're talking about governments focusing on the, essentially the, the easy to count things so that they can put it as, a, um, a, a strap line with we've got our green credentials because we've planted a thousand trees over the last 50 years and but then then also not saying how many trees have been cut down or you know what's been replaced and the thing that I learned the most uh, you know and has really stuck with me from the UN Commission on the Status of Women was the fact that war and arms are excluded from the kind of the climate policies and they are the biggest polluters and yet nobody talks about that you know the UK had has an arms fair every is it year every couple of years where they're selling these weapons that are contributing and taking away from all that work that we're doing in our homes and our schools with recycling and reducing and reusing and kind of reducing our carbon footprint. And with one missile that gets launched, it's just all wiped, wiped out. And nobody talks about it. And 
I think it's really crucial that we also remember you guys aren't alone. There's teachers, there's activists, there's, heaven forbid, there's some politicians out there who get this, and we've got to make sure that we're playing to our strengths. So, you know, Phoebe, you might not, was it Phoebe? I think it was Phoebe who was saying that, you know, she gets so frustrated walking into those rooms. And, you know, Mitzi was saying about the fact that, you know, and, and Vanessa was saying that we prefer to be on the streets. We prefer to be out there, the people. We've all got strengths in this room. This is why you're so phenomenal. You know what your strengths are and you know when to tag team in each other to kind of pick up that, that part of the, the kind of the challenge. And it is a challenge and we have to recognize it is a challenge. And, uh, you know, I will reflect on the importance of looking after yourself as well-being, which for your well-being as activists, as someone who was a student activist and burnt out and, you know, had to take two years to recover to kind of say, right, this is what I can do. I can't change this all on my own. You crucially need to know that you've got support and you've got people in your corner that you can say, I need a rest for a week. I need to watch Netflix. I need to look after myself and please just hold my space until I'm back and I will come back stronger and more powerful and more focused than I, than I kind of went. So please, you have to look after yourselves because this work is long-term and we need your voices and we need you in all of those great rooms and most importantly on the streets. So kind of thinking about where you know where we are now how can we build that hope you've got a room of teachers and educators from across the world and the numbers keep going up every time I look down more people are in the room if you could say imagine that your teacher the person who inspired you the most when you were at school was sat in this room what advice would you give to them to say how can you give me what I needed at that time to become an activist. And I am going to pick on you. I'm going to start with Mitzi. I go back to how I became an activist. I was able to integrate with the Lumad indigenous peoples and they have this amazing practice of the way their education is set up um, for context. Uh, the Lumad indigenous peoples don't have access to um, education, like formal education. So they've set up their own schools and the government uh, bombs and closes these schools because they see them as terrorist schools. Um, but these schools, the way that they teach their education is empowering and contextualized to their culture and to their experience. It's liberating. And that is the kind of education that we need. The kind that empowers people to not see that activism is... I, I, it's a pet peeve of mine when people say that our, chi our childhoods have been stolen because of activism, when honestly, activism should be something that everyone takes part of. It is just the act of making society better. And even if society was perfect, we would all still be activists because we want to make society better. And so these, this, that is what education should be. It should be something that empowers you to become an activist, to see that making your society better, making your community better, making sure that no one is left behind is something that we should all be actively participating in because that's what activism is, being active, right? And so that is what we need to have, that kind of education that really teaches you to go up against the system that is putting all of us down, really. And it's going to be difficult, I think, especially for teachers, because I've talked to, I, I saw that um, the Alliance of Concerned Teachers is here, and I've talked to some teachers there in the Philippines, and I know that it's difficult because, you know, the curriculum and the system in the school, they're not going to let you teach your students how to bring down the system, right? Because it's part of the system itself. But I've seen how these teachers can be so creative in the way that they do it, and I've, that gives me so much hope. So it's really that making sure that you're empowering your students to liberate themselves as well. 
Thank you, Mitzi. I'm smiling because that is exactly what I teach my children to do, how to bring down the system. And I just kind of sit there and I'm, I'm hearing your voices and I'm just saying, oh my goodness, I wish my students could hear what you guys are saying. You know, Miss Codrington, as I am, is telling us that we're allowed to get into good trouble. We're allowed to get into, you know, to kind of cause that discomfort for the school leadership. So thank you, Mitzi. I'm so excited. I'm so happy. I'm going to go to Phoebe next. <laughs> I wish I had a teacher like you at school. I think in the UK it's so difficult in the same way as in Mitzi, but probably less so. It's We've got this whole thing about being political in our education and teachers are really feeling the brunt of that. We're being, it's, it's such a difficult environment to be teaching about climate just as a baseline, because for us, we say climate is something that's political. Climate is, oh, it's not something that you can divorce from that, that policy side of things. You can't divorce it from its history of colonialism. You can't divorce it from any of these uncomfortable realities here in the UK. But when we actually try to teach that, <laughs> it becomes a very different issue and it becomes something that actively puts the teachers that teach it at risk. What I would say is, please, if you're in the UK or if you're in anywhere that has a similar setup, please get involved in your union to be a teacher, to please get involved in the work that helps to pressure people like the Department for Education, people that have these kind of overarching education policy like powers. We have in the UK the Climate Sustainability Strategy for Education. And that's great. It's great that it's on the agenda, but what it doesn't do is actually change the curriculum. All it does is kind of tag on these little extracurricular things it tags on a natural history GCSE and other things are just for optionals it's just for just to engage the people that are already engaged it doesn't actually engage lower income kids working class kids that are the exact ones that are missing this education kids like me that didn't do science or geography in school they're the ones we need to be engaging in this and they're the exact ones that are being missed out by these policies so tell them that use your power your lived experience as a teacher tell them exactly what kids are feeling and tell them exactly what you want them to do even if it feels like they don't listen I know we're very pessimistic in the last <laughs> in the last question talking about engaging with systems of power but please please and you're not alone when we were talking about community and that you're not alone when you go and talk and go walk those corridors of power and go talk to leaders and institutions please invest in unions invest in your community and please use that as a collective to be able to lobby with us for this change because there are so many people I was in a room full of them at the launch of the climate sustainability strategy of people that were just like this is great but it doesn't go far enough there is a whole room full of people that were agreeing with you and there are so many more online there are so many more in their houses that are thinking this this you're not alone in any of this so please lobby for this change Fantastic. Thank you. I'm going to go to Laura next. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, Laura, if you could talk to your teacher. Oh, um, I actually forget what I thought <laughs> to, 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 to what I was planning to say. Uh, I will say uh, I'm agree. I agree with all of what they have said. Um, I will uh, compliment saying that I think that in education, it's like we need to reinforce the cooperativeness, the cooperative uh, work. So I will say like, I think that right now the education system is very student centered, like one, like just the kid. And I will say that we need more like a whole community dynamic. The education is not only about the students, but also about the teachers, about the parents, about the administration people, about everyone. I think that in a way we need to make that more obvious and like, I don't know, assessments and like evaluations and all this kind of stuff. It shouldn't be just about the student, but also like like teamwork and like a, a whole process like to the, to the, to the, to the course that it like reinforces the need of community, like to start breaking all that individualism that is pretty rooted in the Western system. Brilliant, thanks Laura. And you're right, it is about the whole community. We, as teachers, we're part of the community and we go into that room and we should know that we are able to tap into and be supported by people outside of the classroom. So you're absolutely right, thank you. And Vanessa, what, could, what would you say to your teacher if they're in that room? Well, just to really add on what everyone has said, I think it would be to invest on what is inside of all of us. 
I believe that there is a working power and a working strength in our spirits that, you know, can push us to have the hope and the joy and the peace even when things get frustrating as we advocate for a better world. So I would really say connecting and paying attention and investing to the working power within us because therein comes um, a great deal of strength to help us deal with what is on the outside. Thank you, Vanessa. And I, I, I did, I'll be honest, I kind of size, uh, sidestepped what Phoebe said as a, as a teacher in the UK, um, because I know that when I come into the classroom and I had a lesson with my year nines yesterday and I was in the, one of these sessions and I literally left where I was watching this online session and went into my class and said, you guys are so important. You need to know how important you are. And there's people across the world watching what we're doing and what you're doing and you're not doing it alone. And hearing the four of you just, you know, just kind of makes me realize how important we need to, it is that as teachers, we feel empowered to give some of that power and all of that power to our students. We're not gatekeepers. We should actually be building them up. Um, and I said to my students, I can't wait until I'm old and retired because I'm going to get into so much trouble. I'm going to be chaining myself to stuff. I'm going to be super gluing myself to things. I'm going to be needing to be bailed out from courts all the time. Um, that's where my retirement money is going to be. It's going to be getting into that good trouble and they're going to be so embarrassed by me. They're going to go, oh my gosh, there's my teacher. And oh my goodness, she's just embarrassed us all. Um, and I think as teachers, sometimes we need to be given that confidence what I, I've got some we haven't got very many questions from the room but we have got some comments and I'm going to read um, I'm going to read some of them out because I think we when we're talking you don't always see the, the conversation that's happening on the side but um, there was a comment from Philautia um, who says under pressure from the National Teachers Union in Angola um, because of climate change they were forced to change the school calendar um, to a time when the country gets warmer, because it was a problem for, students, for children to go to school in the cold weather. And they had a lot of difficulty because the number of children with respiratory diseases increased, which kind of really highlights the fact that this isn't just learning about climate change in geography and in science lessons, and if you're lucky, in citizenship and civics lessons. Actually, this is real life. Um, and I think this is where it's really important that we are given voices to the communities to be able to express the impact it's having. And I kind of want to see if there's any of you who want to respond, respond to that real impact of what climate change is, is having. I can say something. Um, there's this it's almost the opposite here in the Philippines because we used to have our summer time, like the break in between schools was during March, April, May, which is our summer time. But to keep, um, what's it in English? To keep up with the global standard uh, where school ends in August um, and starts in June, July. Oh, no, no, sorry. Starts in August and ends in June, July. Uh, the calendar shifted. So it's actually really bad for our schools and our students because it's hotter. And that means that we also start during the um, monsoon season, um, all just to adjust to the global standard um, so that we're more easily able to globalize. So it's this thing where you can see that the system doesn't prioritize, again, the students. It doesn't prioritize the well-being and does not contextualize our learning um, to what we actually need, but rather just to fit into the system. And this interesting thing with Angola, where you know there are actual impacts, it's the same that's happening in our country, that we are losing so much of our school time because of the typhoons. I remember in high school, I missed maybe cumulatively like two months worth of school um, because of typhoons happening one after the other. Um, and it's something that we need to learn to adapt to as well. And that's the thing that 
that's where you bring in the call for reparations also that reparations doesn't just go into renewable energy systems reparations doesn't just go to um, building infrastructures but also to the loss and damages that we've already experienced uh, to the time that we've lost to the cultures that we're losing because of it and so it's really that also I wanted to say um, that we have activists from Angola and I know that they they're not very well connected within their country yet so if you want to get connected, I will look for their Instagram and I'll put it into the chat. Thank you, Mitzi. I think Laura looked like she was desperate to jump in. Or... No? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mitzi. And I think you're absolutely right. I'm picking up this idea of prioritizing the well-being, the well-being of students and of teachers. It's almost as if it's a case of educators are just expected to make it work. And that is really frustrating for us because we're trying to do what's best for our students and the pressures that we face. But, uh, you know, that idea of reparations needing to be more than just one thing, it needs to have that 360 approach to what that actually means and the impact it has on the people that it, it is going to impact on. And unless we're talking to community, it's not going to happen in the way that is sustainable. I think that's I think that's kind of how I I kind of pick up on it. Um, the, another comment we've had is um, from Tabeth, who says, "What a session! I feel inspired and motivated as a woman to watch these confident young women. I'll change the language myself. Young women saying out, uh, speaking out of them, uh, speaking out on their their thoughts, speaking out their minds um, about empowerment, and that is empowering." But we need more of these sessions and it would be more, it's really important that we're also able to have these physical opportunities and also, and I think virtual opportunities to engage with each other face to face. Because when women come together, we can achieve powerful things. And sometimes until you're in that space, you don't recognize it and you don't feel it. And then you leave and you go, now I'm, I know what that means. So is there anybody who wants to kind of refer on that otherwise I'm happy to keep going through the fantastic comments we're getting I'm gonna actually I'm gonna change that question slightly I'm really bad as a teacher I throw out lots of questions to my students so sometimes I'm not the best chair I'm gonna ask this question how do you all nourish each other as as women activists how do you nourish each other tell us your tips Can you repeat the question? I didn't understand the, the, the end of the question. How do you support each other okay. in this really difficult space where sometimes you're shouting into a void where you feel nobody's listening to you? How do you support and build each other up? I think it's because we know that we're not screaming into the void alone. We're screaming into the void <laughs> together. Um, I, I, not literally, but <laughs> for me it, it is that community it is I always go back to why I became a climate activist which is the strength of the indigenous peoples that we have here in the Philippines and then adding to that knowing that I have friends literally from every continent um, fighting for the same thing and that gives me so much strength because then it almost feels like the whole world is coming teaming up together um, there's so much strength in, in that people power I think yeah, I think it's providing that community. It's it's showing people that feel so alone and feel so afraid that they have a community that they can hold on to, even if that's not like a physical local community, even if that's online. It's showing them that they have a community that they can be afraid with, that they can like find comfort in, that they can fight with. And I think it's in those communities that change happens because you feel like you've got your family you've got people that you can fight alongside when Mitzi was saying the first time that we all met in person in Glasgow it was the most transformative experience of my life because these friends that I had made online these communities I'd built online were suddenly physical and I could hug them and it was amazing because it felt like I was coming home it felt like my family was all there with me and that's the community that we need to build that's a community that we have built as women in the climate movement or as anybody in the climate movement that's the way that we create change Vanessa, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I also think that community is really important and 
for me, it's a place of knowing that when I decide to rest, um, someone else is continuing to speak up. And when that person decides to rest as well, I will be speaking up. So community is really important to know that, you know, you're not doing this alone and it's a whole global movement. Fantastic. I think Laura, come with yeah. your top tip. Yes, like um, regarding support, I don't know, like as an activist and as friends, we also try to make time, although it's difficult to make time to talk about other things different to activism. Uh, just like pretty like banal stuff. Although it's like, now that I was thinking is it's it's funny because even when we talk about like just chill stuff like activism and our values and our all like things that like yeah like intersect in our like other chill aspects of our lives. But yeah, we try to talk about other things as well. Fantastic. I, I, you guys have learned already what it took me years to learn. So thank you so much for sharing that because it is about community and that global community. You know, this this, this conversation alone is showing that these um, international borders don't mean anything when we come together into a space. You find your sister, you find your auntie, you find your grandmother, you find, you know, you find that person across borders. And that's why it's so important to create these spaces. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I've got another point which was raised by Hema or Hema, who said, I like that these young women have recognized that minorities make up the majority of people in the world and the impact of industrialization on climate change. I think you've all touched on or kind of reflected on the importance of engaging with indigenous peoples as well and making sure that we all have those voices. Um, Lucila, uh, you see Lucilia in uh, Mexico says, or Mexico says, we must tell our young women that their voices are essential. I think this is a really important message, especially to teachers. Um, the best way to cultivate courage in our daughters and other young women is by example. I'm going to, I am, I'm kind of throwing in um, off script questions as we're going. So I do apologize if it throws anybody, but who is your inspiration? I am going to ask that. Who is your inspiration? Give me some time to think. When I first started in the global climate space, I joined a group called Fridays for Future Digital, which Mitzi was a part of. And genuinely, I'm not just saying this because Mitzi's on the panel. She is part of the reason that I have become so invested, <laughs> shall we say, so much obsessed, but I will choose to say <laughs> invested in the climate space. Seeing somebody that is so driven, but simultaneously invested within community and invested within that constant stream of regeneration and love and just a just being very mindful about the way that you approach the world but simultaneously being an absolute badass incredible that is genuinely part of the reason that i have become in any way what i am right now take your flowers mitzi take your flowers i'm going to go to vanessa next who's your inspiration well i would say like the different young women who are continuing to organize and mobilize in their communities. I think that is very inspiring and a source of strength as well to keep fighting. Thank you, Vanessa. I'm gonna get to Laura. Um, ah, right now, like this Sunday, we have presidential elections in Colombia. Um, and like in the last month, something amazing has happened because uh, late, like I was saying previously that uh, Colombia is the most dangerous country to be a social environmental defender. And actually like uh, black women and social environmental defender uh, started to do campaigning to do president with no resources, literally with no resources. Uh, and 
she like in the first round she got a lot of a lot of votes like crazy like no one like she was like the 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 i don't know how to say it, the 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 like the the big new like the big transformation that we were having because also she talks about colonization she talks about patriarchy she talks about racism like in front of like the old white politicians that like rule the country and right now although she's not running for president but like as by vice president is crazy like everything that she has done is crazy all the transformation and change that she, she has achieved and we're so close like we're so 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 close to get to the change to have like a to have her which is francia marquez i haven't heard her name to have francia marquez as a vice president and as a minister it will be amazing like right now she's like my strength like i have a lot of anxiety because of the presidential elections but like Oh, I will be like so, so happy. Like this is everything that we have fight like as a Colombian activist uh, in local, national, international spaces. And like, it will be like a first step to get to climate justice, social justice, gender justice and all of this. I, I, I can, that, that hope is so tangible. I think I, I've got my fingers crossed now as well. Uh, you know, I, the hope is so tangible there. Um, so thank you, Laura and Mitzi. Mine would have to be, I think I've said this over and over, but um, it's it's really the strong women uh, leading a lot of movements here in the Philippines from different sectors, but also in the climate space, I think I, I'd like to, I think that like, at least in the youth climate space I've been in, it's one of the most women led movements that I've been, aside from like an actual women's rights movement, right? Um, like there's so many young girls that are really leading and are, pushing the way to climate justice in their own countries. And I think that gives me so much strength as a girl also to see that it is something that I should be taking up as a role. It is something that I should, you know, embrace, as you said, take my flowers. It is something that we should be, you know, taking. Um, but outside of activism, someone that really inspires me to be kind and to be patient is my mom. She is one of the nicest, kindest people and I used to think like I used to be a very mean person I used to be very impatient and tempered and I I said I would tell I told my friend one time that if I can be nice now because I'm an activist and I realized that I need to be nice as an activist anyone can be kind and then they said that depends were they able to see kindness and feel kindness and I realized that I know what kindness looks like because I grew up with it with my mom um, and I think that's so important to realize that Sometimes people are horrible because they were never granted that kindness. And so we have to be the ones to, you know, be that kindness in their lives so that they see what kindness looks like. Thank you, Mitzi. Oh, your mom. Oh, I love it. I love, I lo as a mom myself, I love that sometimes my daughter also lets slip what she sees. So tell your mom, you know, tell her, kind of get that message to her and just let her know that you see her because it's so valuable. And it's, you know, it's just being able to know that we're there as we're all side by side. All of those people that you've all mentioned, all of those sisters, they are there side by side and they see you and even you know even when they're exhausted I, I'm telling you that that hope and that and you know that oh that feeling that you guys have all expressed and we know and we see and we also want to protect it we also want to protect it and to protect you so that you also know that you're seen and you're appreciated so uh, on behalf on behalf of of older women across across the world i'm saying thank you to all of you as well to thank you to you three are you four i should say because what you are doing is so vital and it gives us strength as well um we've got uh, we, the questions and the comments are coming in thick and fast now um, um a question that we've got is um, for those who want to learn more or might be in places where information that is provided um, around climate action, climate change is politicized, who or what would you recommend as if you had one go to, what would you recommend to the people on this call to go and engage with, whether it's a podcast or a book or a website or a song? what would you say is something that we all need to know about? Uh, 
Uh, for me, I think that, sorry, uh, I think a good start would be engaging with the work that Lara, Phoebe, and Mitzi are doing. I think that would be a very good first step. And I'm certain that can be found on social media and to see how to support platform and help amplify the stories and experiences. Thank you, Vanessa. Who else? Anybody else like to give us our homework? I think it's hard to pinpoint one place because if we, there is no one place that has everything and that is actually how we get stuck in one like point of view. Um, so I will say, I think as educators, I hope you have enough access to the climate science part and listen to the science. And this is actually something that Laura said before, so I'm going to steal her words. Um, it's not, don't just listen to the science, but also listen to the people. Um, it's not enough to just listen to scientists, but listen to the people on ground. Um, and that is a lot more difficult to find, actually. And as Laura said earlier, that is something that you have to actively look for. Um, finding the, the links to colonialism and capitalism and imperialism, that's not something that's going to be in textbooks, sadly. Um, so it is something that we will all have to actively look for in our own countries and internationally. On the, on the point of climate information, there's a, um, a great youth-led project called Project EAM, which is bringing climate resources into different national and ethnic languages that it isn't normally available in. So like talking about climate policy, but also like the specific climate science. So I'll link that in the chat because it's going to be amazing. Laura? This is difficult because um when you were saying like podcast or like, I don't know, a movie, something, um, I usually, like for example, now for my dissertation, I use a lot of Spanish like language uh, references. And I know that like most of the people here are uh, English speakers, uh, no? No, we are truly international in here. So please recommend Spanish or uh, Colombian or Latin American references. Okay, so uh, oof, now it's like there are so many options because before, like, I was saying that, like, my point at the beginning was like probably a first uh, thing that I wanted to say is that as educators, uh, start breaking these language um, barriers, uh, just to have the opportunity to be able like to speak Spanish here. It's amazing, and the same happens, for example, in international uh, spaces, as for example the COP. It's crazy because I have I'm pretty lucky to be able to 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 speak English, uh, but for example for the COP, the, I have two friends and they don't speak English, and they start and they had to wait for two hours the first day of COP, of COP because no one in the organization team of COP twenty six knew how to like they didn't have that basic requirement to help the Spanish speakers and like Spanish is the second most language spoken language of the world like I cannot imagine like the other languages that are not as uh, like they don't have a, that quantity of people speakers and regarding the Spanish speakers I will say I'm gonna tap uh, like my 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 recommendation of Spanish also you can I'm gonna uh, write some scholars that probably you can find in English maybe I don't know Fantastic. And, you know, this is part of being a global community. And I'm so proud and so happy that EI have made, you know, that's one of the crucial parts of the work that EI does is making sure that language isn't a barrier, because when language becomes a barrier, it becomes a silencer. And so we have to make sure that those spaces where we are able to engage with each other. And I've had the fortune to do work with, with EI in a number of countries. And I've had to use my, uh, my GCSE um, Spanish and French and German to try and, and to communicate. But actually you can understand so much when you're in a space with people talking about the issues that impact on you and that you're passionate and you care. So, you know, it really is important to make sure that the language is there but it's also how to articulate. So that's absolutely crucial. We've got only a few minutes more and I'm going to ask us to kind of start thinking, 
to uh, you know kind of our reflections after discussion today we've got one more question from the audience as such which is what has been the greatest challenge you face as a woman activist and how do you overcome that so we're ending on a bit of hope you know identifying the challenges but also saying but this is how I overcome it so I'm going to ask if we can just spend a minute each kind of just reflecting on our conversation and thinking about that important question. How do we face that challenge and overcome it? And I am going to start picking on people. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to go Vanessa, then Laura, Phoebe, and then Mitzi. Um, well, for me, I just, I can give like one of the examples when it has felt really challenging to be a woman activist. And it was things like, you know, being told that I was standing on the street because I was looking for a man to get married. So to me, that was uh, quite frustrating for me that I'm trying to uh, demand for climate justice. And that's the best thing, that's the best interpretation a person can get from that. And how I really overcame that was one, I stop paying attention to comments or even reading comments especially on social media because they can be very uh, draining and the other thing I just really kept looking at the bigger picture and to just really look at what we were fighting for and that vision and it really gave me strength to continue. It's me now. Um, probably one of the like challenges, most most mo most challenge moment that I had to face is when I decided to come to London to study uh, because I was having this dichotomy. I'm studying with a funding a scholarship of uh, the Colombian uh, government, but like it has a part. A twenty percentage of loan, um, and I had this dichotomy of okay, well, I'm an activist. I really like I make a lot of critics of like the imperialism and like this Western society, these powers centralization. But I'm gonna go to a British university to learn their own stuff and like to even have like a small part of a loan. To, to study there when I can just save my money, keep working with my community, with my pets and family, buy a little piece of terrain and just live pretty chill there. Like I had this dichotomy and I had a conversation with a cousin. Um, he's indigenous and he's a social leader. He's old, like he's like 40, 50 years old because I, my, my family is huge. Uh, and one of the things that he said is like, one of the biggest challenges as a social environmental leader that especially doesn't have the like the opportunity to, to have like these opportunities of education because I'm here because I got the opportunity to learn to speak English, thing that most of my family don't have. And one of the things he said is like, as a social environmental defender a little, uh, one of the things that it, it presents a barriers is the language, the technical language, because you need to have like a title, you need to speak as a politician, you need to have the proper terms. Um, and like when he said that, it was like, okay, I have this opportunity. I'm like one of the most privileged person of my family because I had, I, I can speak English. I'm gonna take this opportunity, although it's, it can sound at the beginning like kind of contradictory like yeah the opposite to my values but I'm just take the opportunity to use to understand this western society be very very critical and then take that knowledge and use it for my own purpose fantastic thank you Laura Phoebe I think my initial thought when you asked this was 
the universal experience, I think, is particularly as a young woman in political spaces, when you try and do this kind of political lobbying side of things, you are either not taken seriously because you look young, or in my case, you, you don't wear makeup, so you look really young, or you just, they don't take you seriously just from the outset. But the other thing is very rampant sexual harassment. It's my Twitter DMs and my Twitter DM requests, because I am visible online, are horrible. They are either men that are just disgusting, or they are just openly criticizing the way that you look instead of the, the opinions and the thoughts that you have. It's a really, I don't have a solution for this. This is why I was um, like reluctant to talk about this because I, I can't think of a solution other than reinvesting yourself in your community, which I feel like a broken record at this point. I have made the use of incredible organizations here in the UK, like the Young Women's Trust or Our Streets Now that talk about sexual harassment, particularly as a young professional. But genuinely, I can't think of a solution beyond that. It is a really hostile space to be a woman, particularly when you try and work in these kind of political spaces and do that heavy lifting. It's, it's very difficult. <laughs> it's probably my answer to that. And that's, you know, that's absolutely fine because we cannot underestimate the importance of community. We generally can't. Um, and especially when you're in political spaces like this, you do need to know that you've got somebody you can go and sit next to and they'll just give you a hug or they'll just say to you, I hear you, I see you, I know the space that you're in. Um, or sometimes you just need to be able to cry together or sometimes even worse, shout at the world together and knowing that you've got somebody at your side to do that. that it can never be underestimated so or undervalued so say it as many times as we need to Phoebe. Mitzi I come to you. I think it's the same as what everyone has said mostly it's the harassment the belittling the outright misogyny especially in countries like the Philippines where our president is a very fascist and misogynist president where he has made sex jokes um, and rape jokes and um, military generals have said directly in, this is a direct quote, that young girls wearing short shorts calling for the protection of the environment are doing it to entice young men to join the rebel army. So we have been belittled as, to tools to entice men, but also our calls for protecting the environment have been led, um, connected to terrorism. And it's the same that I just don't look at the comments anymore and I just don't look at the messages and I surround myself with people who I know I'm safe with and that I know that I can reflect and process these things with and I understand that you know the fight for climate justice is the fight for fight changing these things too and making sure that this doesn't happen to us um, or anyone really um, so yeah. Thank you, Mitzi. And we can't have a conversation about being an activist without recognizing that we are ex we are existing in very misogynistic spaces, um, and we can only hope and pray that it changes. But it will only change if we keep calling it out, and that's where the strength again has to come from the community. So I'm going to take the next minute. I know we've gone over and it's like my lessons at school. The kids are going, miss, it's lunchtime um, and we're still going and we're still discussing. Um, but I do want to take this time to thank you all. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you, Mitzi. Not just for um, giving the time today for which has been a, such a rich hour, but for the work that you're doing and for what you give to make sure that not just your voice is heard, but the voice of others. And you, you know, keep reaching back and bringing forward each other as we heard already today around how you bring the next, the next person forward and you support each other. And I think the message that I've taken away from our discussion today has been about hope and about change but also about the importance of self-care. And as I say before, this is something that you can't underestimate, but that comes from that global community and that connection and knowing that you're not in this alone. And education has got such a huge part to play and that needs to be built, not just from our students kind of saying, this is something that's important, but actually as teachers, we need the tools and the resourcing and the time and the training, but most importantly, the confidence that we may get into some good trouble, but it's our unions that are there to support us. And when we have the support of our students and the community and our, you know, the, 
other teachers and educators, there is nothing we can't achieve. And so we have to keep these conversations going because we need to keep learning from each other. But most importantly, we need to create these spaces because there are lots of women and educators and activists who aren't in this space today. There was 100 and, nearly 165 of us in this room. And hopefully each of us will go out and talk to five people, whether it's our students or whether it's our colleagues to say, actually, this fight is intergenerational, it's intersectional, it's intersectoral. We've all got a part to play because we have to keep recognizing this is a challenge and we focus on the goal. We're not gonna be able to do this all on our own, but we need to each take our little piece of the jigsaw and do what we can and slot it into place. And as teachers and educators, we have to make sure that our children and young people are empowered to be able to do that. So take up your space, make sure that you are taking that space up. And as teachers, we've got a responsibility to create that space and to make sure that our students know they can walk into that place and they can make change. They can influence the world. They don't have to do it alone. And it is a big job. But if we all do our part, we can make that change that we need to make. So thank you so much to all of you for your time and for what you're doing. Our children and our young people see you and they know you and they are silently and sometimes vocally cheering you on and just know that you are part of something that is so big and we are there with you side by side. You are inspirational, you are fantastic, you are beautiful and you need to make sure that you protect yourselves because you need to know that this is a big fight and you're doing the most phenomenal work. So thank you. And on that note, I've got some business to do, which is if you're interested in joining Education International's work on climate justice, then please take part in the EI Teach for the Planet campaign. There is a link in the app which is um, helping to direct us to the work of Education International's Manifesto on Climate Change, Education for All, and join the network. We've talked about community. We've talked about the fact that this is a global um, uh, struggle. Join that network as, of teachers so that we can create that space for each other and we can work out how to get into that good trouble, but also where we can get into that sometimes not so good trouble where it's necessary to make sure that we are creating these spaces. I definitely want to thank the interpreters. They've done a phenomenal job. They've kept up with my speaking really fast. Um, when I have an hour, I try to squeeze in two, but I'm a teacher, who doesn't? So I want to thank each of our interpreters. And can I remind all of the, um, the EI um, delegates who are in the room that the concluding segment of the conference begins in, well, it was 30 minutes. I think we've eaten into that time slightly, um, which is uh, 14 hours Central uh, Europe, Europe, Europe time, CET. And in this session, speakers will share and reflect on the conversations that have taken place over the last three days of the conference. And the winners of the fourth World Women's Conference Contest will also be announced in that session. So on that note, I wish you all well, get home safely, Take care of yourself, take care of each other's until next time. Thank you.